So now that we have that kind of high level conceptual introduction to the Ray framework, let's dive into some code so we actually understand what Ray can do for us and how it can do that. And if we go to the GitHub repo here, we're at cyclothin slash scaling dash data dash science. Now, if you're familiar with Git, you can actually clone the repo. And if you click on code here, you can see the clone URL. So when I do update the resources, you can just simply pull down the changes. But if you don't have Git set up, if you don't have a GitHub account, you can just download the files as a plain zip. So if you click download zip, it just downloads all the files locally on your machine. The disadvantage to this being that if I do update anything, if I do fix anything with the code or the materials, you'll have to re-download the zip. Whereas with the git method, you can just git pull the updates or the changes. So if you want to just actually run the example and, and the code, I packaged everything up into a Docker container so that it runs now and it runs in the future whenever you're watching this video across different operating systems, whether it's Mac, Windows, Linux, and hopefully to make it a little bit more reproducible. If you're not familiar with Docker, it's similar to other virtualization software like virtual machines or Vagrant. And the really nice thing about Docker is that it's an open source project and has wide support across operating systems and environments. So to get started, we're just at the Docker site here, get started. And the easiest way is to just download Docker desktop. So I'm on a Mac, it tells me download it for Mac, but if you're on Windows or Linux, it'll say the download for your respective operating system. But if you don't actually want to deal with all of the Docker business, Binder is a project that lets you launch a Jupyter notebook right in the browser directly from something like a GitHub repo. And it does this by spinning up a Docker container in the background and connecting you to it. And the other really nice thing is that the Binder service is free to use. Sometimes if a lot of people are using the service, it might take a little while to actually spin up and a little while in this case might be a minute or two, but once it's running, everything runs pretty effortlessly in the browser. So this is what you should see once the notebook gets started. And for this example, we're gonna be using the intro to Ray IPython notebook in the notebooks folder. Here I am in JupyterLab on my notebook, and this might look a little bit different than the interface that Binder gives you, but all of the code in the notebook should function exactly the same. So to start, we're gonna import a bunch of libraries. All of these are just in the standard library in, in Python, and the external libraries we're gonna be using is Ray, pandas and, and requests here. So to start, to kind of give an example of something Ray can do, it's not necessarily something you would use Ray to do, but let's say we're trying to index the internet or do some computation across all the websites on the internet. So here I'm actually just getting the top 500 domains according to moz.com. Um, and this is basically just a little example. We're obviously not gonna be able to index all of the internet in, in this tutorial, but for the sake of argument, let's say this 500 represents the 500 sites we need to do this computation to. And in pandas, we can actually do something fun and interesting here. So since this file that we're downloading is a CSV, we can get the text of the response, turn it into basically a file with string IO, and then feed it into pandas and parse the CSV. So here we can see we have the rank, the root domain, how many sites link to that domain. So let's get into Ray and, and all of its goodness. So to start the Ray processes or the Ray framework essentially, you're going to call ray.init only once. So typically you just do this at the start of your, your driver program. This Jupyter Notebook is my Python driver program. This is going to be the program that's gonna shuttle off commands to the Ray cluster itself. Some interesting things you can see here is that it has IP addresses for the nodes, for the Raylet. We'll see this in just a bit. It actually has a really nice web UI that gives you some information and statistics about the machines in your cluster or, or the server, as well as a bunch of other information on where it's storing logs and, and so forth. So the first abstraction that Ray gives us is this ability to run functions remotely. So let's say we want to index these pages or do something with all of these web pages. 
will define an index function and it takes as input a URL. Now for this simple example, let's just return the URL. So typically if you're trying to index the internet, you might do something where you parse all the text of the web page, you store it in a database, you build some sort of index. But in this case, for the sake of example, we're just interested in the fun things Ray can give us and not necessarily in actually indexing these things for real. But let's just say this return URL split is a proxy for all the computation we would want to do. So if we were doing this in just standard Python, just locally on a single machine, we might do something like a for loop or iterate through all of our URLs. So if we just want to iterate through this, we can get the root domain column. And here, if we just actually print them out, we can see that it correctly gets them. But instead of just printing it out, let's say we want to index it. So in this case, index only returns something, it doesn't actually print anything. So for the sake of demonstration, now we can basically, if we do want to do some further processing, we can count up how many are .coms versus .orgs. But again, this is just kind of a contrived example to showcase some functions in Ray. So now let's say we had millions of URLs that we need to process. We can't just run it on our single laptop or a single machine. The really magical thing is that you can run this in a distributed fashion with little to no changes in your code. So the main thing that you have to do in Ray is add these decorators to the functions you want to run remotely. And it's as simple as just saying at Ray remote, decorating the function you want to run in a distributed remote fashion. In this case, we just run it. And the only change when we execute this, instead of just calling the function index, you call the remote method on index. So in this case, index is a special Ray remote object. And if we want to run index remotely on our Ray cluster, we simply just call it with dot remote and pass the same argument. So if we run this, we can see something interesting is that instead of actually printing out the results of running this, we get a bunch of these object refs. And this is kind of one of the core things in Ray is that it runs all of its code in an asynchronous fashion. So if you're familiar with things like Node.js and JavaScript, all of that kind of programming is done asynchronously where you run some computation and you eventually get some result back once it's done running. So in this case, since this index function could take a while to run, Ray says, I've scheduled this function to run on my cluster and I'm giving you this reference back to get the result when it's ready. So instead of actually just running this in a for loop and essentially forgetting all these references, let's instead run this in a list comprehension so that we can collect all of these object references in this list at the end. So this is the same for loop just written as a list comprehension. We can see here we get returned a list of object references and in Ray, it often refers to these as futures. So it essentially gives you a promise of this will run at some point in the future on the cluster. And when you do want the result, you basically resolve the future. In this case, we have all of our future objects. There should be 500 of them for each one of our URLs. We have 500 futures. And to actually resolve these, we can use the Ray function called get. So here, when we call ray.get and we pass in, we can pass in one or a whole list of futures, it actually resolves the result of that function. So since our function is just returning this URL.split, we actually just get a list of all the resolved values when we do ray.get. So if we were actually doing something where we needed to really distribute computation and not just do this trivial kind of string parsing, this would be very powerful. We can debug our code locally, test the function that a single function works on a single input, and then when we're ready to scale it to our entire data set or our entire algorithm, we simply can just annotate it with ray.remote, and that same function is just magically gonna run distributed across our Ray cluster. So if you remember that, that diagram I showed you, this notebook is running on the head node, this is running in the Python driver, this is the Python driver program. Whenever we attach Ray remote to a function and whenever we call that function with dot remote, it essentially sends this function to the Ray workers. The workers execute that code 
and then they ship their value back to the driver program and you locally get the result on your driver program here. The one thing to keep in mind though is that all of these functions execute in whatever order kind of asynchronously. So you don't have any guarantees when you're running Ray Remote that the first URL is gonna run before the second URL is gonna run before the third URL. And to demonstrate this, we can just inside here basically say which URL did we start? So that's I'm sleeping on URL. We sleep for half a second and then we do a print of now we're returning that URL value. So if we run our remote functions again, we can see it goes through the first four URLs. Since in this case, I think I have four worker nodes in my cluster. So it says we have four nodes. Let's run one of these functions on each of them and they each return in a different order. So once one of them returns, once apple.com returns, it then schedules a new one, in this case, Microsoft. Once support.google returns, it then schedules LinkedIn and, and so forth. But the thing to keep in mind is that these may not necessarily be returned in the same order that they were scheduled. So in this case, they actually did return in the same order. So apple, support.google, google.com. But if we rerun this again, we can see that the order they get scheduled might actually be different. And this isn't necessarily the order that dot remote is called. This is the order that the index function begins to execute. So depending on the communication in the cluster itself, even though these had dot remote called in a different order, the actual function might begin executing on the cluster at a different time in a different order. And here we can see that the first return result is actually from support.google, which when we were scheduling them was the last to start. So this asynchronous nature is something that you need to assume when dealing with Ray. So this is one of the things that it gives up. Ray gives up this strict ordering of when code's running for the benefit of running things remotely on a cluster. And the last thing before I ended this video that I wanted to just kind of introduce was the Ray dashboard, which is kind of this really nice user experience. So if you go to that URL that Ray init spits back, so in this case, it's on localhost port 8265, we can see here that we have all the machines and kind of what's executing on each of them. So here I reran that same code that basically does the index function remotely. We can see here that we have four workers on four cores. Since again, all of this is running locally on my laptop, I didn't connect to a server in the cloud yet. And the nice thing about Ray is it doesn't matter if the code's running in separate processes on your laptop or on separate machines in the cloud, the API is identical. And here we can see how much RAM we have, how much disk we have. We can look at all the logs and look at the errors. So this is a really good way to kind of stay updated on how the cluster is running and if there are any errors or things going wrong with individual machines or if there's anything going wrong with the cluster as a whole. And here it's running the index function remotely. This is how much CPU it's using. This is how much memory it's using. And in this case, since the logs are gonna print out as we're actually running these, the number of lines in the logs should kind of give you a sense of how much progress has been made, but you can do better, smarter things to kind of track the progress of all these functions across all of your, your machines.